Welcome back to this very special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We're with the lead investigators of this year's beef quality audit and we're talking about the results. Keith, I want to begin this segment with you and talk specifically about those face to face interviews you did. After all those interviews, what are some of the key findings? We performed a procedure in, in this national beef quality audit that's referred to as best worst scaling. Hmm. And best worst scaling is just a technique where you can prioritize or arrange in terms of priority a long list of attributes. Mm. And so we did that with everybody that we interviewed in, in phase one. And what we learned across all of the sectors of the industry that food safety and eating satisfaction were the most important mm. uh, criteria for quality that people expect in, in, in the beef supply chain. And so they became extremely important. The interesting thing about both of those quality categories is that when we asked the interviewees what were the strengths and the weaknesses of the beef industry, industry currently, uh, they listed both of those categories as both a strength and mm. as a weakness. And so what we think is that we've made progress in both food safety and eating satisfaction, mm. but we need to continue that progress because they're still such important demand drivers for the industry. Let's talk about eating satisfaction. Um, what did they tell you in terms of the, uh, the, the components that make up eating satisfaction, in their opinion? It was actually quite interesting. Um, when we asked them to define what the, the term eating satisfaction meant to them, uh, of course, by far and away, most of the companies that were interviewed said, well, tenderness and taste is most important. But interestingly enough, for the first time, uh, those sectors of the industry that are closest to the consumer, mm -hmm. so the food service portion of the industry and the retailers, they said that now flavor is the most important criteria for eating satisfaction. Mm. And so as we move forward, uh, we need to not forget the importance of flavor and taste to the industry. Very interesting. Jeff, what other quality improvements did you find? Well, it's interesting in our phase two information when we looked at the, the amount of quality grading in the different grades, we found that the percent prime and choice was the highest it's been in, uh, during the history of the quality audits. In fact, it was 61.1% this year compared to five years ago then in the 2005 audit, we, it was 54.5%. So pretty dramatic increase in percent choice and prime. The other thing that's interesting is how many of those carcasses really fit the target? And when we identify or when we've asked people to identify what's the target to them, they'll say it's, you know, what percent of them are prime, choice, select, yield grades one, two, and three. And so we went from 81.7% all the way up to 85.1%. So greater number of them are fitting the targets for the industry from quality, but even greater number of them are fitting for both quality and composition. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, the industry has, has really just implemented instrument grading since the last quality audit. And so what did this year's uh, BQA audit tell us about the implementation of instrument grading? Well, you remember at the beginning uh, stated that we had uh, carcass measures for like 8,000 carcasses actually in the plant, mm -hmm. but then we have 2.4 million observations from the instruments that are used in the, in the, also in the plants. And what we found was how close those measurements were in the uh, yield grade and the marbling score and the ribeye area, how close they were, they were almost interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Which to, to our team, we feel like that that gives us great confidence that either system uh, works well to identify the quality and uh, yield characteristics that are so important to the beef industry. Now Jason, Keith talked a lot about food safety as well. What role do producers play in food safety? Well, one of the things we found out is the importance of low-stress cattle handling to producers. There's a lot of evidence out there that low-stress cattle handling is conducive to produ production of high-quality beef. And cattle producers told us basically the same thing uh, in terms of what they feel uh, their methods are for influencing the quality of beef. As we talked earlier, one of them is producing healthy cattle. Uh, the other one was uh, the use of low-stress animal handling and stockmanship skills. And so uh, producers uh, were basically uh, saying to us it's, it's very important to them to, uh, to influence quality by, by using some of these new techniques. 
Uh, we also ask them when they're working cattle or processing cattle, mm -hmm. uh, do they use a uh, electric prod as their primary driving tool? And over 98% of producers said that they did not. Mm. So there's very, very little uh, use of electric prods, and, and producers are really focused on uh, low-stress cattle handling techniques. And is this an improvement? Uh, that's a good question because we have not asked this of producers before, and there's really no data from historical records. Mm. Um, but low-stress cattle handling has become a mainstay of beef quality assurance training, mm. and uh, we would only assume that that has improved over time. Jeff, after all the extensive data you've collected at the packing plant level and, and all your experience, I mean, was there one thing that kind of surprised you? Well, one of the things that we, we found that was so important to us, or we felt like was important, was the, the number of cattle that came to the plant with some sort of identification. Mm. And we found that we had uh, over 97% of the carcasses or the cattle coming in that had some form of identification. But what's unique this year compared to the previous time was the number of them that had true individual information. And in fact, in 2005, we had 3.5% of the cattle had electronic ear tags. Mm -hmm. This time we had 20.1%. Mm. And then if you take the individual visual tags, just the normal tags that have individual numbers, that number increased from 38.7% all the way to 50.6%. And if you do that combination, we're going from roughly about 40% of the animal, animals with a, you know, really good individual identification all the way up to 70%. Mm. What would you suspect is driving that kind of increase? We feel like the, the demand for age and source verified uh, cattle, the, the marketplace is demanding more knowledge about where the animals have come from to meet various uh, requirements, export requirements uh, for Japan and places like this. And so really if you look, the, the domestic and foreign markets are demanding more knowledge about where the cattle are coming from. And I think it, we see it reflected mm -hmm. in the number of, of cattle that are coming through the system that have individual identification. Dr. Hola, that, that information, I guess, would indicate that our industry has a pretty good start on identification. Uh, uh, did you find the same thing in, in your section of the audit? Yeah, we asked producers if they use individual animal identification to track animals' uh, withdrawal time for a pharmaceutical product use, and we found 78% uh, of producers do, in fact, use individual identification for that purpose. And uh, I think we would all agree that individual identification of an animal, such as an ear tag, is a great start in terms of record keeping and trying to track and document more information about cattle. That's really encouraging news. So what does all this mean for the consumer? That's next on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <music> 